Hi everyone, and welcome to Module 0.5, Research Design and Ethics. Here are your vocab, pause if you need. This is just a chart that's showing you the similarities and differences, strengths and weaknesses of the various research methods that we've already discussed in the previous mods, pause if you'd like. So there are two different types of research designs that we're gonna look at today. Quantitative, which is where you look, you are asking a question in your research that requires data. It requires a numerical answer. So you might use something like a Likert scale, which is a questionnaire scale that goes from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And you would collect data on you know, what percentage of people strongly disagree, neutral, strongly agree, right? And you would analyze that data. Maybe you want to ask a question that is more in depth, that's more of like um, the narrative, like so this many people strongly disagree, but like the why behind that perhaps, then you want to look at qualitative research. Why do people feel that way? Here's just a cartoon to kind of show you those different characters. When we're looking at research experiments that are done in a lab, are they actually useful to predicting real life? I mean, that is the point of research, right? It is to help us generalize information into our everyday lives. And what we have found, and if not, we wouldn't be using it, is that yes, research done in a lab is generalizable to everyday life. And the reason why we use a lab, as you probably know, is because it really reduces confounding variables and it's very restrictive. So there are two governing boards that have created ethical guidelines for psychological research. The first is the APA and the second is the BPS. The APA stands for the American Psychological Association. And they have said in terms of animal care, this is very broad, you can go to their website and read all the very specific guidelines for ethical research. And I've linked them here. Um, that human, humane care in healthful conditions. That's our key thing to know for this class. In any sort of testing, should minimize discomfort. So if there's some sort of procedure that might re be painful, pain relievers, painkillers, anesthesia, whatever is required to reduce that comfort or eliminate that discomfort. The British Psychological Society also has its own set of guidelines. For example, natural housing, companions for socialization, Again, these are the basics that I want you to know. So humane care, socialization, no pain, um, and healthful conditions. When you create a research study, you write a proposal. That proposal goes to an institutional review board made up of a scientist, a non-scientist, one community representative, and at least one, yeah, but there's five people total. And their goal is to make sure that you are following the ethical guidelines. You might be rejected, you might go back and reach, redo and come back again. But again, if you're doing something that might cause discomfort or they think is unnecessary, you just like wanna know if you can do this thing, like it's not going to be approved. It has to be something that has a benefit to society, whether that's to animal society or human society, which by the way, humans are animals, right? That gets part of the answer to why do we use animals in research? Well, humans are animals, and so it's useful to look at these simplified systems. Many animals that we use in studies have shorter lifespans, have more simplistic neurological systems, and so it's easier for us to look at, for example, a sea slug or a honeybee and understand their neurological mechanics than it is to look at the human mechanics. We also use animals because they can help us discover preventative treatments and treatment for diseases such as insulin, um, resistance vaccines to protect against illnesses and change a whole society um, and replace defect defective organs. We use animals in a lot of these cases.
Um, and then finally, animals also benefit from this research. A lot of research is done to improve the lives of animals, whether it's animals in shelters, animals that are in rescue habitats, um, education and awareness to increase empathy in society for different animals that might not get as much love and attention as others. Um, but there are ongoing debates in using animals for research. Number one, should we place human lives above that of other animals? Number two, if we do put human lives above other animals, what safeguards should be put in place to protect animals? Again, I just already went over what the APA and the BPS generally say. You can go to their website if you want more. And then there's this other question, not really question, there's this other point that, um, these are just some more pictures of protests and debates. But there's this other um, perspective about how humans do use animals, and the majority of what we use animals for is eating them. It says animals used for research is only a fraction of the 1% of the billions of animals killed annually for food. Researchers are strongly for government regulations to protect primates, dogs, and cats, and 74% support government regulations for rats and mice. So again, like, you know, debates on this spectrum of, of animals and who we seem to care more for than less. Um, and one example is researchers studying dogs in shelters, looking at their stress levels, and founding that a certain way of handling them and a certain stroke, a certain pet, um, reduces, their e reduces their stress. And that actually helps them get adopted easier because their behavior looks different because they're less stressed. Here's an example of another study on the same topic, but it's about um, outings and their cortisol levels. When we go to human ethical guidelines, there are four you need to know. Number one, informed consent. Giving participants information on the procedure of what's going to happen, how much time it's going to take, and any discomfort you might experience. Oh, you're going to have to run up and down stairs a lot. Oh, you're going to have to take a paper and pen test. If you are a minor, it's called informed assent. And obviously you need a parent or guardian to sign for you. Number two, Protection from greater than usual physical and emotional discomfort. So again, running up the stairs, you will, might have some physical discomfort in running up the stairs, but it is not greater than usual discomfort. So that would be okay. Number three, confidentiality. So your data, let's say on how fast you run up the stairs, can be used, but it cannot be tied to your personal information. That is um, your independent results are kept confidential. And the last one is debriefing. After the experiment is over, you need to be debriefed. That is an ethical guideline. This tells you the true purpose of the study. Sometimes you think you're going into a room and you have to just wait in that room until something else happens. But that room itself, the waiting room, is actually the experiment. They can't tell you that the waiting room is the experiment because you might act differently, right? So the debrief tells you the true meaning. Also in that waiting room, there might be confederates. Confederates are people who are used in a study to, well, when we want to see certain behaviors, let's say we're studying conformity, for example, or in this case, they were studying obedience in the Milgram experiment. When they're studying that certain things, if they're studying conformity, let's say, they're not going to tell you we're studying conformity. And we might have a bunch of people in the room, in that waiting room, and we are trying to see if you will conform to their behavior. They have a script of behaviors and things to say that is part of the experiment. And once you are debriefed, you will be aware of that. Okay, so our takeaways. Remember the difference between quantitative research design and qualitative. Remember that the APA and the BPS are the organizations that create the ethical guidelines and that an institutional review board is what determines and improves if they're following those ethical guidelines. Animal research faces criticism, but is also the reason we are safe from many illnesses and provides benefits to animals themselves. Um, there are ethical guidelines for animals, we talked about there are four ethical guidelines to know for human research 
And remember that deception can be used if it is justifiable. That sums up mod 0.5. I will see you in class. Thanks.